Welcome to the Nursing Post podcast, All Nursing All the Time with Ashley Moore and Rosa Horsley. For this episode of our podcast and for Men's Health Month, we're discussing erectile dysfunction. As always, our goal is to inform and start conversation. Although less taboo as the years go by, erectile dysfunction is one of the most researched topics on the internet by men. We've all seen the commercials, the man pops a little blue pill and he's ready to go, living his best life. But why are men so embarrassed to talk about it? I think it's just their livelihood. They feel like that their life evolves around that one area. Exactly. (laughs) And if that's not right, then nothing else in the world is right. I particularly wanted to do this episode because I'm a former urology nurse and Mm -hmm. I could spend, like I was telling Ashley earlier, I could spend probably a whole episode just on the things that I've experienced and endured while working in urology on the seriousness of this. I mean, it does affect quality of life for men and because and it their is, spouse. Yeah, and their spouse or significant other. And because um, it's so taboo and still so embarrassing, we kind of want to take that stigmatism away from it. Right. Well, we'll give you the information that, you know, some people don't even probably want to Google because, well, what happened? Well, they it's are like, Googling it. They are Googling it. It's like the number one thing men Google. Yeah. We looked that up. We were not surprised. I'm just going to say. Well, that's actually how we decided to do this episode, right? Yeah. Because we Googled and we were like, what's the number one health concern of men? And this is what came up, erectile dysfunction. And yep. so we're like, and we'll some, do it. Some are not like, what do I do to treat it? But like, does every man get it? You yeah. know, when does it start happening? Like, or, and how does it happen? And, right. So it's, I guess, a thought process even before it happens. Absolutely. Which you do want to, I mean, preventive medicine is the best. That's the one thing men want to prevent. I am so proud of all you men out there who are Googling. Yes. Uh, And also Google other things as well. And we do have some statistics. It's not as many as some of our other episodes. Um, This is according to singlecare.com. The worldwide prevalence of erectile dysfunction is expected to increase by 322 million men by 2025. That's astronomical in my opinion. And that's out of the International Journal of Impotence Research. That's a big number to me. It sure is. Uh, Erectile dysfunction affects about 30 million men in the United States. One in 10 men are estimated to have ED at some point in their lifetime. In one study, and when this included eight countries, the U.S. had the highest rate of self-reported erectile dysfunction at 22%. Spain has the lowest rate of self-reported erectile dysfunction at 10%. Well, apparently in Spain, they are living their best life. Hey, good food. ED affects about 10% of men per decade of life. Mm. So what that means is 50% of men in their 50s are going to be affected by erectile dysfunction. 80% of men in their 80s. So that's how you kind of can correlate that. Men older than the age of 40 are three times as likely to experience complete erectile dysfunction, you know, versus a younger man. And lastly, erectile dysfunction is less common, but increasing in young men. It was previously believed that only about 5 to 10% of men under 40 experience erectile dysfunction, but a more recent study showed that it's actually more like 26%. That's pretty significant. And that was according to Boston University School of Medicine in 2002. And the Journal of Sexual Medicine in 2013. So it's affecting a lot of, a lot of men and then like I was saying earlier, then that affects that their their significant other. Absolutely. So if you don't know what erectile dysfunction is, as we mentioned, it's the most common sex issue men address with their doctors. Doctors also refer to this as impotence, which is a problem getting or keeping an erection firm enough for satisfactory sexual performance. And erections are caused by the blood flow into and out of the penis. Um, Conditions that change that balance of the blood flow coming in and out of the penis are what the common causes of erectile dysfunction are. And there are two really big causes that stand out for erectile dysfunction. 
And that is um, atherosclerosis, which is hardening of the arteries. And this happens to all of your arteries. So in men, it happens to the arteries that feed the penis. So what happens is the blood can't flow because there's buildup in plaque causing the hardness, the, you know, the hardening of the arteries and therefore men can't get an erection because they're not getting enough blood flow. Cause yeah. that's what causes the erection is blood flow. Correct. Really. If a man starts having erectile dysfunction issues and they don't have any known heart disease, this actually might be a really good, like, Hey, we might need to look into this because you might actually have. There's something there that's restricting yes. your blood flow, whether that be, you know, hypertension, whether that be, you know, coronary artery disease, correct, um, high cholesterol, mm -hmm. you know, even smoking constricts blood your vessels. blood vessels. Mm -hmm. So those are things to kind of keep in mind. And then the other most common cause of erectile dysfunction, there's two, is diabetes. And that's because diabetes can cause small vessel disease, which, you know, we have to feed blood flow. Absolutely. And then it also causes nerve damage. So there are other causes. Um, we did kind of touch on them a little bit. You know, obesity, lack of exercise, hypertension, high cholesterol, smoking, alcohol, your age, and sometimes medications can affect, you know, blood flow. Mm -hmm. So as they affect changes in blood vessels, they're going to affect changes in the blood flow. Right. I thought it would be really interesting to understand because if I was a man... And you told me that certain medications can cause erectile dysfunction. My first question would be, well, which ones? Well, yeah. You know, it's that whole benefit risk. Yes. 25% uh, of all erectile dysfunction is actually a side effect from prescription medicines. And this is according to um, a Harvard special health report. So the most common medications that have this side effect are antidepressants, anti-ulcer drugs, tranquilizers, and diuretics. And if you kind of like think about it, mm -hmm. as nurses, we, pro we see the correlation yes. here. Even antidepressants in women decrease libido. your libido. Mm -hmm. Of course, it would also affect a male's libido as well. Mm -hmm. Anti-ulcer drugs, tranquilizers. I'm not trying to be funny, but honey, if you're trying to put me to sleep, how am I supposed to have an erection? Right. Like I'm, I'm You're fighting. Exactly. It's yeah. contraindicating to it. So, I mean, I think as nurses, we can kind of see the correlation between some of these medications. Yes. And then the other medications that can cause um, erectile dysfunction are antihistamines. Their job is literally to dry you out. Like yes. that's its main purpose and function in life. Antiandrogens that are used to treat prostate cancer mm -hmm. and anticholinergics that are used to treat an overactive bladder, incontinence, um, COPD, and some symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Remember, these drugs kind of also work as antihistamines. Their whole job function mm -hmm. is to dry you out. So you can imagine if you're having like an overactive bladder situation or some incontinence, and then you're taking allergy medicine, that that's going to like have a double whammy kind of effect. Oh, absolutely. And then of course, anti-cancer drugs. You know, it all compounds because if you have diabetes or oh, let's even go back to basics. Let's say you have high blood pressure mm -hmm. and then you get on blood pressure medicine. And then with that high blood pressure, you also have some fluid retention. So you're on a diabetic medicine, or, excuse me, a diuretic medicine. Mm -hmm. So you're pulling your extra fluid off because you have swelling. You already have heart disease. So right there, you have two things against you. Yeah. And if you add any other problem on top of that, well, then it just all compounds. So it is a, this is a legitimate conversation for men to have with their doctors because there are so many different reasons why you could be having it. It doesn't necessarily mean there's something wrong with, you know, your penis no, it, per se, per se. Yeah. It's, you know, the internal organs and structures that are causing the issue. That's why it's like super important. Um, you know, people don't really understand the importance of kind of living a healthy lifestyle because mm -hmm. if you are looking into preventative medicine, you're, you're talking about a healthy lifestyle, healthy eating habits, mm -hmm. you know, an exercise regimen, um, all of those things play a part into not needing these medications that may also compound the effects of, you know, having erectile dysfunction. Right.
I did find um, it interesting that I was able to find some psychological or emotional causes of erectile dysfunction. I, you know, for me, I always kind of thought of sex being an emotional thing more commonly for women than men. Yeah. That is very stereotyping of yeah. me. And I understand that. No, I think I, I would have had the same thought process too. But, um, so to see this, I, it made me feel better. Like there, cause there are, cause it is an emotional thing, even for men, mm -hmm. maybe not as emotional, but yeah. everybody's different. And so one study looked at newly diagnosed patients with heart disease, but they did not have erectile dysfunction who started treatment with a beta blocker, specifically the one called the Tenolol. And then those who were told about the possibility of having erectile dysfunction with that were almost... Well, they rep a third of them reported that they had erectile dysfunction. Right. However, if they were not told that that medicine could lead to erectile dysfunction, only 3% said that they experienced any problems. That That's like, um, that's kind of like the studies that they do where, you know, they give you a sugar pill. Yeah. And tell you that it's the pill. And then they come back and say, oh, yeah, it worked 100%. But that person was on the sugar pill. It's right. like the psychosomatic. Placebo. Right. Yeah. And so if a man thinks that he's going to have erectile dysfunction because they're taking a medicine, mm -hmm. they're, you know, that's 33%, a third, versus if you don't think you're going to have any issues, only 3% actually had issues. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a big, big, big difference. Yeah. You know, other things that can impact depression, anxiety, relationship conflicts, stress, and this can be home, work, social, cultural, religious, any kind of stress. And then actually being concerned about your performance, you're stressing about. Well, yeah, when you think about it, you know, when you when you're stressed out, what does that what does that do? Right? Well, your mind's not focused on what you're doing. Yeah. It, you're, it's what is it cortisol levels, you're you're mm -hmm. anxious, you're, yeah. you know, you're working yourself up. How is blood flow supposed to get where it needs to go? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So there are some treatments for erectile dysfunction. The main source of treatment uh, when I was a urology nurse, you know, were oral medications. Viagra, the little blue pill. Levitra, mm -hmm. Cialis. Cialis comes in daily or as needed doses now. Right. Not only does um, Cialis treat for erectile dysfunction, but you can also take it daily to help with an enlarged prostate. Mm -hmm. We did have a few patients in urology that took it daily and it helped them out in more than one way. And Stendra. Um, and these help to improve blood flow to the penis so that with sexual stimulation, they can obtain an erection. There's also penile injections, trimix, bimix, and papaverine. It's injected directly into the base or the side of the penis. Fun fact, Sudafed may help treat an erection that lasts for more than four hours. And let me tell you why that that is so important to know. <laughs> You know, these oral medications mm -hmm. and even some of these penile injections are contraindicated. Mm -hmm. This is why it's really important that you go to a urologist who specializes in this field so that you don't end up with lifelong effects. And there can be serious so, adverse effects to this. Absolutely. When you're taking these medications, whether they're oral or penile, you're not supposed to have an erection that lasts longer than four hours. And if you do, that is considered a medical emergency in mm -hmm. which you should be calling like 911 or be at the hospital. Right. Because if it goes on any longer than that, it will leave you permanently with erectile dysfunction amongst other diseases like pyoprism and other things. Mm -hmm. So it's super important that when you're being treated, that you're being treated by a specialist. Yes, there are. And this is something that I learned interurethral suppositories. I didn't even know this was a thing. The one that I found mostly was called Muse. And it's a medicine that's actually inserted into the urethra at the end of the penis using an applicator. There are vacuum erection devices. Um, these are devices. It literally pulls blood into the penis. It causes an erection. And then they put like a tension band around mm -hmm. the base of the penis to keep the blood flow in there. And that's safe to do for about 30 minutes or so. You don't want to keep that there longer. Yeah, you the, the whole purpose is blood flow. Right. And you're restricting the movement when you put that 
um, band on. Band on, Correct. exactly. There are several types of penile implants, and they kind of go into really two categories. Some people put them into three, but really there's an inflatable and a non-inflatable or a malleable one. The inflatable ones, they are fluid-filled tubes that are placed inside the penis that are joined together. The tubes are joined together at the base, um, and that is placed in the scrotum between the testicles. So you can literally... You, you literally, you literally inflate them. Pump. You pump yeah, it up. By squeezing it. Correct. And then the non-inflatable, which are two rods, usually made of silicone, and they're inserted into the man's penis, and it gives the firmness that's needed for sex. Um, and that implant can be, it's literally, malleable means you can bend it. So you bend it downward to pee, or you bend it upward to have intercourse, and but it stays firm all the time. All the time. So, all the time. Yes. There is penile vascular surgery, and that surgery bypasses the penile artery that's damaged for whatever reason. And that's typically used in um, younger men that have had some kind of trauma. So that way, blood flows to the penis still kind of naturally, but it's just literally bypassing the main artery that usually feeds the penis. Yeah. So usually when this happens, I know men know or have heard of, you know, breaking their penis, yes. but it's not literal. It's not a bone. So it's not a bone that you break when you break your penis. It's right. actually like a muscle. Right. And generally you'll hear a pop sensation. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why they think they broke it. That's why they call it a broken penis. And so this surgery is usually used for correction of that or injections literally into the penis called Peroni's injections mm -hmm. can be used to, to treat that um, broken penis. And so to wrap this up, I thought it would be nice to maybe have maybe cause some icebreakers would be a good way to put it. Some ways that Ming maybe could have this conversation, especially if they don't, they don't know which way to go. Absolutely. I mean, being a former urology nurse, a lot of times the patients would call and they would try to make an appointment, but they were never direct or forthcoming necessarily mm -hmm. with the reason why they needed to be seen. So sometimes they would just make up stuff and say, I can't go to the bathroom or, you know, whatever mm -hmm. would get them into the urologist's door. Yep. But then when you pull them back, grab their vital signs and you're talking to them and you're trying to obtain their history, you know, you have a series of questions to ask and it's important embarrassing for them, especially if you're a female, you already kind of have a barrier there between mm -hmm. the patient and you. So you have to like be very considerate and, um, you know, try to make your presence and the conversation, you know, less embarrassing and less taboo. It was hard enough for them to just schedule the appointment. Right. So we have to keep that in mind. Absolutely. So I figured if maybe you're a more laid back person, you could ask questions, you know, is it true that my health could affect my sexual performance? Or you could say, hey, are there any treatments that are there to help improve my sex life? Or you could even ask, what are the causes of erectile dysfunction? And then, of course, you have more direct questions. My sex life isn't what it could be. What can I do? I'm having difficulty with, you know, getting or sustaining an erection. I heard there are new treatments for erectile dysfunction. Is there something that I can try? And some people feel like discussing this with their primary care doctor or an advanced care practitioner. They're just not comfortable. They don't think that they're given all the options. And that's why, you know, Rosa, I have stressed so much that seeing a urologist would be easier. They've had this conversation all day, every day. I'm telling you, they're not going to blink an eye at it. And they probably will be more forthcoming with asking you directly questions like, hey, are you having trouble with erectile dysfunction? Are you having trouble with an mm -hmm. maintaining an erection? Versus your primary care doctor might just skip right over that because absolutely, and it it's kind a of a uncomfortable, issue, you know. Issue. And that's mm -hmm. still a urology exactly specialty, so they have to. It's a process of elimination, mm -hmm. and your best place to start is at the urologist's yes. office. So you can always find us and our references on our website at thenursingpostpodcast.com. You can subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform, leaving your thoughts, 
opinions and comments and suggestions there. And we want to thank you as always for listening to the Nursing Post.